reminder, we are recording uh, this webinar um, so that we'll have available um, for later uh, information. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Zachary Garza, as you can see on my screen here. Um, and I want to go ahead and really quick and uh, introduce my team uh, to you all uh, that you all probably, most of you already know, but as you know, our uh, program manager, Ryan Perry is here with us. We also have uh, Julie Johnson, who is our outreach support. Uh, we have Elisa Don, who is based in Seattle as a trade specialist. And we have Rebecca Weber, who is based here on the east side with me. Uh, she's based in the Tri-Cities. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thank you guys for being here with me and helping me with this uh, webinar. Um, and then really quick before I introduce our contractors, I want to go ahead and uh, just re-announce to you all that are here that if you are interested in, uh, in continuing conversation with our reps today, um, there are some one-on-one -on -one opportunities. If you haven't received that email or if you haven't uh, gotten that information, please reach out to me or Julie and we'll get you that information so that you can get registered for those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, they are they are limited capacity and, and they are filling up quick. So please uh, reach out if you're interested in that. Um, so without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our uh, reps today from South America. They're based in Brazil um, and uh, they are with River Global is their company name. Um, our rep who uh, will be uh, 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 doing the, the webinar, most of the webinar is Carolina. Uh, Carolina, thank you so much for being with us. We also have Leo, uh, Le uh, Leonardo, and then we have uh, Jose. Thank you all for being here with us. Would you get, uh, Carolina, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you and you can take over. Thank you so much, Zach. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for us to be here with you today. As Zach mentioned, I'm Carolina Nascimento. I'm a partner with River Global. And uh, I would like to introduce my team here too. So I have Jose Madeira, my partner and founder of River Global. Hey, Jose. And I also have Leonardo Hi. Silva here, so. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good. So let's start the presentation and um, we'll be sharing details about the South American market and the main uh, markets in the region that uh, offer opportunities to Washington uh, egg companies. And um, Leo and I will be conducting the presentation, most of the presentation. And if you have any questions, please take notes and I will save a lot of time by the end of the, the session for discussing the market and clarifying any questions that you may have. Um, okay, good. So uh, I think that uh, I, I've met some of you before, so it's a real pleasure to be here with you again today to talk more about the market and specific uh, opportunities for your companies. And uh, it's ha it has been a pleasure to work with all the WSTA team over the past months planning this webinar and of course meetings that uh, we'll have afterwards. But uh, let's say I always, like to start our presentations about South America, uh, talking about, of course, a general overview of the market, but also uh, asking you to open your mind and kind of think of South America as a new market. Because uh, sometimes when we, we are working on this type of uh, you know, events, some of the companies are just uh, super busy with other traditional markets worldwide. I mean, Europe, Asia, probably Asia to you because uh, we're talking about the Pacific coast. So it makes sense. These are traditional and solid markets offering solid revenues to your companies. But uh, when we are in international trade, we must look to the global map, to the map and say, hey, where can I expand my exports to you? Where can I find more opportunities? And uh, that's when we say, hey, have you looked into South America? So usually think, usually exporters think of South America as a net competitor. 
probably because of all the commodity, global commodity game, which makes completely sense partially. But uh, at some point, it offers also opportunities for uh, commodity exports, intermediate agricultural items, as well um consumer ready products so value added products are also very uh are good prospects for this market okay so don't be afraid of the commodities and the well-established food industry and feed industry in the market actually talk the food industry here that's one main target to you as well because these are the ones demanding a lot of ingredients so when we're talking about grains we're talking about wheat we're talking about dairy so all of those items will find solid opportunities in these markets um so that's pretty much what uh, i want to bring to you and uh, just uh propose you to reset your mind about south america and think about this market as a new one and where we can split more eggs uh in the global trade game okay so let's do it. And uh, there was quite a long introduction. But I'm uh, talking about uh, 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 we are River Global, as I mentioned. We are a 20 year old consulting firm. We specialize in, in marketing and international trade. And uh, we are dedicated to agriculture. So, food and uh, feed, food and beverage feed, so uh, is our expertise. We, uh, we have headquarters in Sao Paulo, but uh, we also have offices in uh, Lima, Peru, Santiago, Chile, Bogota, Colombia, and uh, we are expanding to Mexico as well. And for the WSCA, we'll be covering South America. Um, by the way, uh, we work for the agricultural uh, groups in the US, so some of you are familiar with our company for other activities too. Um, Okay, so today, as I mentioned, I have Jose here, our founder, uh, myself and Leonardo. So just putting uh, pictures or faces to the names here. And uh, let's start with a um, final with South America. So South America, we're talking about a 12 country market, actually 13 if we include French Guiana, but as we're saying, French Guiana, this, is, this counts as Europe. So let's just count as South America. And uh, it will be prioritizing here during the presentation and also for the market efforts, uh, the following countries it will be Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador, which are the ones with uh, more um, clear opportunities, let's say, while Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Bolivia, Venezuela, Suriname, and Guyana do offer opportunities, but uh, which are limited, and they'll be happy to work with you in case you have a specific interest in any of these markets, okay? And um, something that uh, we also wanted to show you is kind of kind of basics, locating South America in the, globe, in the world map. So when we are talking about exporting Washington egg products to Asia, because uh, it's kind of natural to just uh, ship containers through the Pacific, it's pretty much the same for South America, since we have uh, uh, many of the countries with uh, FTAs with the, the US uh, located in the Pacific. So that will be kind of easy to ship goods to these markets. Okay, highlights to the market. When we're talking about um, um, the, the region, we're talking about uh, almost a $2.7 trillion GDP. This is a 2019 number because we always say that a 2020 wasn't a typical year. So let's just uh, take the information that uh, the GDP dropped the last year about uh, 7%. But uh, the expectation for growth this year, 2021, is good. And uh, some of the countries, of course, will be growing more than others. But uh, in general perspective, the average growth expected will be over 3% this year. The population is 426 billion, so 
quite a large population here. And uh, it's already a established market for US ag exports. It's a uh, destination of uh, $7.3 billion every year of uh, US agricultural goods. That this is 2020 numbers, okay? So quite solid despite the COVID-19 facts. But uh, the state of Washington is only exporting 185 million. So there's a lot of room for growth here. As I mentioned in the previous slide, um, kind of best uh, prospects uh, for this market, especially even better prospects, let's say, for countries that have FTAs enforced with the US. So we're talking about traditional markets in the region and very solid economies like Chile, Colombia, Peru. And uh, the good news is that Ecuador is also negotiating uh, an agreement with the US. So probably one more market to be easily explored uh, in the upcoming months, years. Let's see how, how much time that it will take to be concluded. Uh, also, the, the strategic uh, the ports and uh, in the Pacific also help. So that I'm talking about especially Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Chile here. And uh, as I, I said, this is a pretty um, uh, fast growing market, not only for commodities, not only for intermediate products, not only for ingredients, but also for consumer products. So we see booming retail, booming, at least before the pandemic, a booming food service that we expect to recover at some point. And uh, so let's keep an eye on the specific opportunities that we'll be presenting over the next hour. And uh, in addition to the FTA markets, we bring Brazil to you because uh, this is the largest consumer market in South America. So despite not having an FTA enforced with the US, it is still a solid economy. It is still a growing, uh, we do see a, a growing middle class here. And uh, despite all instabilities experienced with uh, COVID-19 uh, last year or still in place, uh, we do see imports coming, uh, entering, um, this market. And um, on the top of that, we see the US as a trendsetter. So consumers see US products, food products, as of high quality. So they do want to have access to US foods. And uh, that uh, not only applies to consumers, but also to the industry. So the industry, the food industry, the feed industry is always watching what are the U.S. is doing. So this, the U.S. is always in, uh, in a way of um, watching the U.S. is always in a way of inspiring their own industries and developing new products with your ingredients. So let's uh, think about though, that too. And uh, for just, um, you know, closing the highlights here, talking about COVID-19, uh, we still have uh, restrictions in place in most of the countries, especially in Brazil. Uh, Chile is the one leading the vaccination right now, but all the other countries are still experiencing uh, kind of a delay with the vaccination. And uh, as much as that evolves, we'll see uh, markets getting more solid and of course, uh, waiting for your visit anytime soon. Okay, so talking about uh, the market and um, a little bit more of updates here. We, as I mentioned, we still have a few economic challenges and the incentives uh, are in place in most of the countries, which is boosting consumption or at least helping supporting uh, consumers to keep consuming. Um, we also have, uh, as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a bit of a devaluation in currencies in the market, especially in Brazil. So we're talking about a 42% devaluation. Uh, so let's keep uh, that in mind when negotiating with the potential buyers. Uh, we do have upcoming presidential elections in Peru, and Ali will talk more about that when we're addressing Peru here. Uh, reopenings are happening and uh, we do see domestic traveling going on, but uh, international traveling is still limited. 
food services operating at 25 to 40 percent and of course delivery and takeout are the most solid and options right now to keep uh, operations going and the retail is super strong is responsible for 80 80 88 percent of uh, all food sales in the market right now e-commerce as any other market <laughs> worldwide is important. Uh, for example, in Brazil, we see over 100% growth in e-commerce, while in Colombia, we see about 60%. So it's really interesting how the market fast adapted to that. Uh, social media and digital promotions are key here. So all vendors, all distributors, retailers, even food service operators, if they weren't using social media before, they are now, and this is key for success right now in the market. And um, yeah, vaccination, we already addressed. So just to provide you with a few details on the, the market uh, sizes too, going back to GDP, these are the main economies. So why we're we always talking about Brazil? Because uh, we have a market with uh, a, a solid part contributing solid to this uh, $2.69 trillion GDP of the region. Okay, followed by Argentina. And then we see uh, a smaller but growing in economy. So it will be Colombia, Chile, Peru, and Ecuador. And when we're talking about the perspectives of growth for the market, we see Peru leading the expectations here, followed by Colombia, Chile, Brazil, and Ecuador. So in just a few years, we see economies just right back where they were before the pandemic, okay? Population, again, Brazil, leading the population I have over 211 million people living in the country followed by Colombia of 50 million and you'll see more details in country by country later talking about the ports that I mentioned so those are the ports that are you should keep in mind when exporting your products to the region for example Colombia has ports in both the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean so that's an excellent way of exploring the market. Then Ecuador, we have Manta, so it's a leading port in the Pacific. Peru, we have Calao and also have Paita. So all the seafood folks here with us today will be very interested in exploring all the opportunities in the processing seafood in Paita, Piura, Sechura, and all the North region of Peru. The same applies to Ecuador. And Chile, uh, we see this country with a kind of wide uh, geography distribution, let's say, so many ports to be explored, but uh, mainly a Santiago port is the one that we should keep an eye. And uh, Brazil with uh, this beautiful Atlantic coast with so many ports to be explored as well. Talking about our trade numbers, what do we wanted to present to you here is where exports are going uh, in the market right to the market right now so the, those are 2020 numbers and uh, everything is official from the USDA numbers okay so we have uh, the main market in the region for US agricultural exports will be Colombia and uh, which is the 10th largest market for agricultural exports in the world uh, followed by Brazil Chile, Peru, and Ecuador. So these are solid markets importing a nice selection again of commodities, but also intermediate goods and the consumer goods. So we will see the distribution here, but uh, basically there is a lot to grow when we take a look to the state of Washington numbers. So the same market that uh, Colombia, which is the 10th for the US, is only the 29th for, w, for, for the Washington. So how can we grow market share here? So that's the main takeaway that uh, I want to give you. So Chile will be the second market for uh, Washington companies right now, followed by Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil, okay? Uh, so let's work together to grow this one, $185 million of exports. So just a, a few references, 
So South America is the destination of 4.8% uh, of all US egg exports when you're considering you know, worldwide exports. But uh, for the state of Washington, that's only two and a half percent. So that only, that only exp that explains, oh, let me see. Oh, okay, sorry. But while Washington is exporting 12% of all these agricultural goods from the US worldwide, while only two and a half percent is going to South America. You see where we can grow two and a half percent to for at least for eight percent. So let's see what we can do here and uh, and um, grow this market share. And uh, of course, this means room for export growth. Product. So you may be asking, whoa, what are the, the consumer goods and what are the, the ingredients that we can discuss here in this market? So when we're talking about the US, we're talking about, of course, Colombia is a leading market for commodities. So we see corn, soybean, soybean meal, uh, pork, dairy, poultry, nuts, pet food, food preparations, fresh fruit, condiments, sauce, seafood. So we see a lot of different items. And the same applies to all the other countries. For Brazil, of course, we have to mention ethanol, but uh, we see a lot of uh, feed ingredients coming to the market too. And the wheat, surprisingly, because uh, remember when I, I, I told you about a competition coming from uh, in, within South America. So Argentina is a leading wheat produce, producer, but uh, if you take a look into logistic costs, sometimes for companies based in the Brazil Northeast, makes more sense to import from the US than bringing from, from shipping up from Argentina. So that's where we can take advantage of the market. Uh, we see sauces, seafood as well, uh, again, Spirits, I do see that we have uh, companies working with spirits, so this is a big uh, prospect, good prospect for not only for Brazil, but for other markets. So Chile would be beer, pork, dairy, Peru, uh, a lot of uh, dairy, of course, going on, cotton, wheat, poultry, beef, but also we have been developing the market for seafood reprocessing over there. So we can talk more about that in a pilot um, seafood reprocessing project that is going on uh, right now with the US. While Ecuador is a leading market for commodities and uh, we do see soybean feed, wheat, corn, and food preparations besides fresh uh, fruits uh, being mainly exported to this market. And in Washington, it's not a, that different of the US, but I want to highlight here opportunities for fresh fruit and most of the countries, wheat, seafood, uh, pulses, beef, and uh, of course, a few processed vegetables too. Okay, so and grains will be very interesting for Brazil too. Okay, so this is the general overview of products and of the region. So let's start with uh, key countries to keep an eye at. So we're starting with Brazil. Um, we, as I mentioned, largest consumer market in Latin America, and uh, we expect the GDP to grow this year at least um, 3.4%. 3 the population, solid population of uh, 211 million, and um, that's, and the, the next information is the one that I want you to take uh, uh, to consider because of the food industry, the well-established food industry in the market is the revenues here generated by these industries over $140 billion. So that's where we can place our ingredients and our uh, intermediate products, or even the seafood that I mentioned that uh, do need to have uh, uh, some processing in the country. The same industry is the same industry that is importing such uh, products. Uh, and uh, despite being a large egg producer, Brazil imports over $11 billion of uh, egg um, products. So it's an important market. Um, of course, we you have been reading news, and uh, we do we are experiencing poor management about COVID nineteen um, pandemic. But um, we do have secured contracts for uh, vaccines, which 
will be coming to the country this year and actually vaccinated already started, but the expectation there is that all adult population be vaccinated by the end of the year in the country. So right now, despite uh, this management, we do see a booming retail when they were taking a look into supermarket, hypermarkets and all the food retail. Uh, these has grown 4.8% in 2020, while e-commerce grew 122%. Um, talking about consumer and uh, what to expect in this market, I would say that uh, average Brazilians, uh, the average Brazilian is very price sensitive, but at the same time, values a lot of uh, important uh, goods because they are sophisticated, they are trending, or because they simply offer uh, they they simply offer the quality they expect the taste they expect and that they remind them of the products they are uh, seeing and uh, eating and the tasting while they are traveling abroad because the Brazilians started to travel abroad for many years so this is important when they go back home and see the same goods at the supermarket shelves. Um, just uh, an additional comment on the currency. Uh, of course, I mentioned the devaluation, but uh, one of the things that you'll be hearing a lot from trade here is about the fluctuation. So more than working with a devaluated uh, uh, currency, the problem is always seeing it, it the, the exchange rate back and forth, back and forth. So, but I'm, I would tell you that um, uh, traditional importers are used to that and uh, we are seeing good experiences about moving imported goods in the market uh, lately. Of course, based in marketing and uh, being uh, proactively working with a delivery and e-commerce that, that has been helping all the players that work with imported products. Uh, let's talk about the regulations and regulatory landscape. Um, some of you uh, know that Brazil is known for registrations, but uh, the first thing that I want to say is that uh, there is a big misunderstanding about the market and the requirements for uh, registration. Not all food products need registration here, so we're talking about, uh, for example, consumer goods, traditional processed foods can just enter the market without registrations, just complying with uh, a few certificates and the traditional internet and foreign trade uh, documentation. But uh, good things, uh, the good thing is that Brazil uh, is an agreement, is a, a signatory of uh, the Codex Elementarius. So we are as well the US. And uh, we do see two main regulatory agencies uh, taking care of uh, food, food and feed products in the market. So that would be MAPA, the Ministry of Agriculture, and uh, most of you that work with uh, animal products of animal origin uh, heard of uh, these agencies as GPOA. And also Anvisa is the agency taking care of uh, pharmaceutical goods or vitamins um, and the functional products in general overseeing all the food products, but are not at requiring registration for all products. Um, Brazil also requires labels to be on the product to be in Portuguese. And uh, we do recommend you to work closely to your importers and uh, study formulations of products to see if uh, all ingredients are allowed to enter the market and um, if uh, we won't have any problem uh, upon arrival at the Brazilian ports. And uh, just uh, to provide a little face spoiler on the market, we are expecting to see nutritional labeling uh, being approved in the upcoming months for this market. Uh, we're still discussing how that will be done. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, not all goods require registration, but which ones then require? So I, will, I would say that uh, animal origin products, of course. So all of you that are working with dairy, beef, and the seafood will need to go through a, a registration process. Of course, uh, alcoholic beverages too. Process will be slightly different. We can talk more about that uh, during uh, one-on-ones or during the, the question and answer session. And uh, for Invisa, the registrations will be required just for infant formulas or 
products with uh, functional claims, as I mentioned, or supplements and probiotics. So very specific products. And uh, the good thing here is that uh, the ones that uh, need registration for the products can work on that online. And uh, since 2017, we have been seeing a lot of uh, progress with uh, this type of uh, registration process. So it's a facilitated process that uh, it's very, it's very much compared with, uh, you know, the, the process before is straightforward, it's faster. And uh, for example, for seafood and for dairy, you can just uh, work on a plant registration or vessel registration for seafood, then proceed to a virtual registration on an online park platform called PGA Seed And uh, for some of the products with a standard of identity, that meaning frozen um, seafood or frozen filets or even beef, frozen beef or specific cuts that have such a standards, the, the, the approval is automatic. Once you input all the information in the system, you'll be good to go. So please um, work with us and work with your partners in the market to go through these steps. And uh, it's very facilitated right now. So talking about the market for retail, as I mentioned, uh, it's a large industry here. It's a like, large segment with a seven, $79 billion revenue in 2020 and growing. And uh, we see this sector uh, mostly uh, led by international chains like Casino, the French one that acquired a uh, group of Pão de Açúcar. So they have several brands like uh, Pão de Açúcar, Asai, Extra. If you have been uh, in Brazil before, you have been seeing these brands here. Associated with Carrefour, which is the largest one and recently acquired, actually last week, acquired the uh, uh, former Walmart uh, operations in the country. So Carrefour is a strong player in the market. And uh, e-commerce and mobile apps are already responsible for 8.6% of all sales in the market. So if you go to all these leading retailers' websites, it will be possible to purchase in their online stores. Food service. Of course, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated moment for food service, but uh, in general terms, it is responsible for 33% of the total food sales in the country. And the delivery and mobile apps is also supporting a lot the continued operations of uh, such uh, operators. Uh, we're seeing smaller and smarter menus. So it's more about uh, the value that you bring to the menus than simply you know, having long lists and long options, many options of products offered. And uh, they are engaging a lot in festivals and promotions. So suppliers have been supporting a lot their clients and extending you know, um, timelines for payment. So that uh, payment terms are in discussion here and have been supporting a lot these players right now. Opportunities. So we always talk, uh, like to talk about opportunities. So we always talk about a COVID-19, the, the, the bad impacts, the, the negative impacts to the economy. But, um, you know, if you take a close look to data, we can see a new consumer coming from this. And a consumer that is more interested in learning from where the products are coming from and learning more about formulations for uh, interested in learning more from uh, about health and nutrition and uh, interested in convenience and frozen items and um, you know easy to prepare items. So smaller packages too, as we're talking about an economy that is still uh, facing a few problems. So if you have smaller packages, uh, consumers you need to pay less for that so they can try more products. So that's a good thing here. And uh, when we mention dollar, 
versus euro. So exchange rate to euro is of course uh, even, uh, real is even more devaluated against euro. So when we are exploring consumer product market, uh, where most of the products uh, imported into Brazil, or while most of the products imported to Brazil are coming from Europe, the US appears as an important alternative to that because uh, dollar, uh, Brazil, Brazil real will be more valued against dollar than to euro. So that's where we can find opportunities. And the many importers are stating that to us that uh, I'm interested in, in meeting US exporters because I cannot afford European goods right now. So that's an opportunity for you. And uh, as I mentioned, the food industry is always looking for innovation and imported inputs. So let's inspire them and say, hey, I'm working with my European customer, I'm working with my Asian customer, shipping these ingredients and they are developing such products, let's do the same for your market. That not only applies to Brazil, but to all South American countries. So the challenges that I mentioned would be regulatory landscape, probably understanding that and not, a, it's not a going through the specifics itself, the currents and uh, the fluctuation. Best prospects here, direct, direct routines. So lots of a WPC, MEPC, DC, good marketing, huge development. It has grown 20% last year. Seafood, nuts, dried fruits, craft beer and wine, uh, along with hops for the craft, local craft beer industry. Healthy, vegan, plant-based, which is trending in all countries globally, uh, easy and ready to eat meals, chilled, frozen, canned, feed ingredients, fresh fruit because of seasonality, okay? So that's pretty much what we have on Brazil. There was a lot. And uh, I invite my colleague Leonardo to talk a little bit about uh, Chile. Go, Leo. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to see you all here, the participation of everyone. And I'm glad to be seeing some of you again that we've worked before in other uh, activities in uh, South America. So I'm gonna speak a little bit more about Chile. Um, well, Chile, as you can see in the image, it has a large coastline in the South Pacific. It is a country um, that it, it has a large extension from North to South. And just so that you have an idea of that extension, that is basic, basically the same as horizontal USA. So from the uh, East Coast to the West Coast. So that will be basically uh, the same um, length. Uh, Chile has a population of 19 million uh, people, but the interesting thing is that 40% of that is in Santiago's metropolitan region, in Santiago, the capital of uh, Chile. Um, so it's a very concentrated, despite this large territory, it's a very concentrated market. Uh, and that facilitates um, uh, distribution uh, into the consumers. Uh, it's a very dependable country of international trade. Its local food industry does not supply the demand. So this is a country that needs uh, to rely on imports uh, and imports of finished products, fresh produce and, and, and all kinds of food and beverage. Uh, Chile has a free trade agreement with the USA and it's a very uh, open country. It's the uh, number one in Latin America in terms of easy to do business. Uh, this is, is a country that has over 65 agreements with countries worldwide. So it's a very open uh, economy. Uh, it is expected to grow in 2021, according to Fitch, 5.8%, according to the uh, Economic Commission, ACLAC for Latin American and, and the Caribbean, 5% as Carol, uh, had uh, mentioned before. Uh, the country went through a social unrest in the end of 2019, so October, November, that had a slowdown reflect um, 
in food service, in the economy, and right after uh, there was the uh, COVID outbreak. Uh, so the uh, Chile, Chile in, in terms of food service, uh, suffered for those two events, uh, one right after the other, but it's a well-developed country. It's uh, the most uh, well-developed in the region, and it has uh, one of the most stable economies uh, in South America and has been like this for many years. Uh, talking about what has been going on with the COVID uh, situation, the e-commerce in Chile has uh, boomed like they the, the country was not compared to other South American countries. It was not that developed into e-commerce and, and delivery. And now uh, they are totally adapted to it. Uh, they had a very strict lockdown um, in the country and they are now uh, leading the vaccination campaign uh, in the region. Uh, Chile is way over the other uh, countries. Uh, and they are um, uh, recovering uh, from COVID because of that. They did a very good job in uh, controlling the pandemic uh, in Chile. So now moving here. Yep. Uh, now, as for some of the regulatory overview, uh, so the main two uh, entities that will uh, oversee the regulatory in Chile is the Ministry of Health. That would be uh, the equivalent to the FDA and the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, kind of the equivalent to the APHIS and USDA. Um, and then we have this agency in Peru, uh, CEREMI and SANG, CEREMI for plants and SAG for uh, animal um, uh products they will oversee the phytosanitary and the zoosanitary regulations uh chile has a zero percent uh duty uh for imports for the from the usa because uh, it is all under the free trade agreement uh and typically uh products will have a uh 19 percent uh value um 19 percent fat at the uh retail uh, store as for the main documentation, uh, Chile has uh, three uh, main steps that are um, done by the importer, which is uh, the license, the registration, and the storage permit. That is all online, uh, and that is all performed by the importer. And then for the exporter, uh, typically the certificate of origin, the phyto or zoosanitary certificate when needed, and uh, in some cases, the product uh, technical data sheet is also required to export, uh, but Chileans importers, they are uh, used to uh, assisting and letting the uh, exporter know uh, what is needed. Uh, as for labeling, uh, the, the, uh, the, the main information that, that has to be in the label in uh, Spanish, and that could be a sticker, uh, is uh, about allergenics uh, of the product, uh, especially for the processed uh, food, uh, the nutritional info uh, table, and these stop signs for high in sugar, high in saturated grass, high in uh, sodium, and high in fat. Okay, uh, and those uh, those. Uh, are the, uh, the, the, the new regulations uh, regarding the um, uh, high in uh, products uh, into Chile. Now, as for retail and food service, uh, Chile has still uh, working with traditional and modern retail, but uh, modern has been uh, taken over. It's a market of uh, over $40 billion in sales. And when we, we mention about the traditional uh, uh, segment, it, we, we, uh, we mention like mom and pop stars, like the ones you can see in the image. Uh, when we talk about the modern sales, the main players are leader, uh, the brand leader, which is uh, Walmart uh, company. Um, 
Then we have Senkasud with the brands Jumbo and Santa Isabel. And then we have SMU with Unimart and followed by Falabella with Totos. So Walmart with its brands Litter and Litter Express uh, has a market share of 43%, followed by Senkosud with 25. Senkosud is a Chilean group. Uh, and they have been uh, spread all around uh, South America. And then we have SMU with 33% share, but SMU is the um, retail with the, more, the larger capillarity in Chile and the a larger number of outlets, uh, and then followed by Totos. There are some regional players uh, in some specific, so th those main players, they are spread all around the country and we have some uh, uh, regional players either in Santiago or other main cities in Chile, like Unico, Cugat and Montserrat. And in Chile, convenience stores has been uh, a trend. They open for uh, 18 hours or more per day. They are in gas stations, in neighborhoods, so they are all around. The main brands are OXO and OK Market, and uh, they have been uh, pretty um, uh, successful uh, in, in kind of substituting what the mom and pop stores has been done so far. Uh, as for food service, um, they have been into a substantial growth in the last decade uh, because of hospitality and because of tourism. Chile has been uh, growing as a, a, a regional uh, center for business and that uh, boomed uh, uh, the, the food service sector. Uh, they had to adapt to e-commerce and they did it. Uh, but of course, they were on the rise pre-COVID and they could not sustain the same uh, sales. Uh, but, you know, a food service has been uh, going in this slowdown all around the world due, due to the COVID pandemic. And they have been uh, requesting some innovation. And we will see that uh, into when we talk about opportunities. Uh, now moving forward so here to the uh opportunities uh when we talk about retail uh people are of course um uh, looking for something uh to care of their family nutrition high nutrition uh products and and also uh for some families staple products so we have in chile both trends of uh, a part of the market looking for uh, nutrition and uh, part looking for ma more massive uh, consumption. Of course, due to COVID, cook at home is a reality. In food service, and then uh, as I was mentioning, the innovation, uh, there has been a uh, look for frozen products and for delivery, like already instead of um, restaurants doing their own bread or, or, or bakery, they, they were looking for uh, products that could be uh, already pre-prepared and they could serve with their meals. So this type of innovation that facilitates the work is what uh, Chileans have been looking for. Uh, when we talk about challenges in this market, it's a smaller market in terms of population compared to the neighbors when you compare it to Brazil, for example, or even Colombia. Uh, it has to, to reach the whole country, it has a large um, uh, territory from north to south. And, uh, oh, let me return back, yep. I'm sorry for that, for this slide. And it is a price sensitive market, okay? Now for the best products, uh, for US products, um, so meats and frozen uh, goods, uh, beer, craft beer, alcoholic beverages in general, dairy products as uh, in, in most of the region. Also sauces, condiments, seasoning, they are uh, also good opportunities. Uh, also in private label for those products, uh, all sorts of snacks and nuts. And as we've mentioned, uh, prepared and ready made products, easy to eat or to uh, prepare by food service. Um, so this is overall Chile, I would like to call 
Carolina back. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Okay, just to add on Chile, we have been seeing interesting flow of uh, seafood coming into the country. It sounds kind of different because uh, Chile is a leading salmon producer and seafood producer, but uh, we see for reprocessing and also because uh, Chileans export most of their own production and it just uh, low quality items uh, remain in the market. So there is an additional opportunity over there. Okay, moving forward to Colombia, and uh, this is probably the leading market uh, in the region, not only for the U.S., but uh, to Washington state, because uh, it's, the, it's the fourth uh, fastest growing economy in the region, of course, before COVID-19. Let's uh, go back a little bit. It's a large, uh, they do have a large population, so 50 million people. And uh, I wanted to mention that they have a, a, a good number of uh, immigrants coming from Venezuela. So over 1 million people um, has come from uh, Venezuela to Colombia. Um, GDP growth is expected to be a good one this year, about a five to six percent. So we're seeing this market recovering a lot. This is the main US like, partner in the region too. And the next year, the US and Colombia will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of the FTA. And just to, so you can uh, you know the trade, the egg trade between uh, the both countries, actually, if, when we're talking about US egg export to the market, uh, have grown 154% since the um, celebration of the agreement. Okay, so this is a sizable number. Um, over 30% of the exports to the market are of a consumer product. So of course we talk a lot of a lot a lot about the commodities, but uh, here we can find opportunities for value-added products. And the US holds 37% of market share in this segment over there. Of course, and when we're talking about imported items. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, ports in both Pacific and Atlantic Oceans and uh, COVID-19 vaccination is a little delayed, but they secured already three vaccines for emergency use when the, we expect vaccination to start. Yes. Regulatory landscape. So um, the first advice here would be work with your partners, work with your importers because they uh, they will be the ones supporting you uh, during the whole process. But uh, basically, uh, products will need plan and product registration, okay? And uh, we do see some requirements for labeling and also import licenses. Um, and they have. Um, a few uh, leading regulatory agencies, but I wanted to highlight uh, the role of uh, INVIMA and also of uh, ICA. So INVIMA is equivalent to the, F the US FDA and uh, while ICA is equivalent to the USDA, okay? And um, some uh, of uh, the products will be required to be registered with uh, ECA, especially animal origin products. So if you're working with dairy, working with seafood, beef, and uh, poultry and pork, pork is, is an important item to the, this market, you, you should work with ECA. But uh, if uh, you are working on a product that uh, will need processing or even going to the food service for further preparation, let's say, you don't need to go uh, through the registration with uh, Invima because Invima will be only required uh, for consumer ready products. And the, everything will depend on risk category. So depending on the HS codes, depending on the product, we'll see what a type of a registration you need, a simple one or a more specific one with formulations, etc. So that will be very important to understand that these classifications, understand your product, where it falls under, and then proceed with uh, registrations and work with other importers. We can work together on that too. Um, okay, so a lot of port inspections over there too. So just so you know that uh, clearance can be a little, uh, 
delaying in the market and that they are also discussing nutritional labeling. Okay, so we expect changes uh, soon for that. And um, the FTA grants all most of the US exports with a zero or reduced import duty, but in the country they have the, the consumer tax or VAT, like they call it, of 19% just for your information, you're not be paying that. So as I mentioned, products that are not a customer ready uh, will not require VMA registration and a police work with your employers. Talking about retail. Okay, so Colombia retail grew over 200% in 2020, which is fabulous. And uh, as Leo mentioned about Chile, they also count away for the traditional and the modern channel. What is the traditional channel? Moms and pops, very fragmented and dependent stores uh, throughout the country, okay? While the modern channel is the traditional retail that we know the traditional retail chains and grocery stores. And uh, I want to highlight here the many different formats they have of uh, grocery and uh, retail formats. So they have convenience stores, they have discounters, they have hypermarkets, supermarkets. Uh, and um, something that uh, we do wanna call your attention to is hard discounts. This model has been growing a lot. So the proposal here, the, the idea or the strategy of uh, these retailers is just uh, having just uh, enough structure to run the store. So you won't see those beautiful shelf decorations or beautiful packaging. Uh, no, it's just to uh, keep it simple and uh, let's remove that off our operational costs and offer more affordable products, more competitive prices to the clients. So that's their strategy. And uh, we highly advise you to work with uh, the Uno, for example, which uh, is the fastest growing in COVA. But uh, talking about the, the retail over there, we're, saying, we're seeing a very fragmented market with uh, the leading operator being Exito, which belongs to Casino as Grupo Ponte Super in Brazil, with uh, almost 3% market share. Then, like I said, uh, Tiendas de Uno, which belongs to COA, 1.8%. Percent. Then we can mention Olimpica, Falabella, Al Costo, and Justo Bueno, and all the other operators that uh, you're probably familiar if you're doing business in the market. And if you're not, let's be familiar with those because they, these are good uh, potential buyers. Okay, and they're talking about products and probably best prospects. So we see dairy products and yogurts uh, being developed, alcoholic beverages. We see bakery. Bakery is an important industry in this country, confectionery and uh, uh, ice cream, which we can also include in the dairy uh, session. But uh, you can see opportunities to so many types of uh, products and all protein to so meat, pork, beef, and poultry will find opportunities over there. Sauces, spices, condiments, snacks. So let's uh, study that in details too. Talking about food service and a, a little bit about a retail uh, still. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention is the importance of uh, the e-commerce here and the delivery and apps too. So the highlights here go to Happy, which is originally from Colombia. And uh, if uh, you do business in, um, in China, you're familiar with uh, all the apps over there. So Happy has been inspiring the platform on that. And then WeChat. So they have a lot of uh, stores and uh, restaurants and uh, grocery stores, and uh, they work on the delivery here, there. Uh, also to mention all the other brands that uh, you can see here. But uh, basically, um, when we specifically talk about food service before the pandemic, we were experiencing 152% growth over the past decade. 20% uh, of uh, the operators were closed last year, but uh, they still have over 42,000 uh, uh, stores, so potential clients to you. And the same as all the other countries, they reduced the menus. 
Uh, but the, the, the government supporting the sector, exempting them of the VAT tax, which is really good, 19% helps. And uh, we do expect uh, a more recovery or recover after vaccination. Opportunities. So growing middle class and solid consumer demand over the past years, and the consumers are becoming more sophisticated. So consequently, the food industry as well. So they want to learn, they want to bring trend, international trends to this market. The same as the Brazilians, they have been traveling around, they have been traveling a lot to the US, they want the same products in their market. Uh, the FTA is a great advantage. So that's how we advise you to explore the market too. And uh, US products are desired in this market too. Health and wellness is growing too, and e-commerce is a great trend in this market. So infrastructure would be a constraint. Uh, you're probably, if you're not, uh, Colombia geography is, is full of uh, mountains. So transportation costs in the market are high and uh, expect your product to be a little bit more expensive on the Colombian shelves. Regulatory landscape, as I mentioned, so registrations and all documentation, you need to spend some time understanding that. And a certain level of protectionism, but uh, this is something that uh, it's easy to overcome because of the FTA and the, the mutual interest between US and Colombia. So best prospects, so we already mentioned commodities, but also dairy, functional ingredients, fresh fruit, nuts and dry foods, craft beer and wine, healthy vegan, and all plant-based items, uh, easy and ready to eat meals. So frozen items is also something with potential. Okay, this is a general landscape of um, trends, it's pretty much what I mentioned. Okay, and uh, I'll hand it over to Leo. Peru, Leo. Thank you very much, uh, Carol, for that. And let's uh, talk briefly about Peru. Uh, so Peru has a population of 32 million uh, people, around one third of that, 10 million in the metropolitan region of uh, Lima, the capital of Peru, and near to the main port, uh, maritime port of Callao. Uh, Peru has a free trade agreement with the United States called the Peru Trade Promotion Agreement. Uh, it is a country that uh, receives over $1 billion per year on agricultural uh, exports from the United States, mainly bulk ingredients, then consumer-oriented and intermediate products. It has a, a, a food industry that is growing, but it still does not meet the demand, uh, like in Chile. So uh, they will, and this industry uh, uses both local and imported inputs to produce uh, food in Peru, but they also import um, finished products, uh, fresh produce, and we're gonna uh, see uh, that uh, a little bit later here in this presentation. Uh, tourism is very uh, important in the country. Uh, it is pre-COVID a $5 billion uh, market in revenue, and Peru is a gastronomic uh, destination. Um, and we are gonna see more into food service. Uh, it is expected to grow uh, to grow around 9% in 2021. It is one of the main growth uh, in the region. And in fact, in the last decade, Peru, uh, despite being a uh, smaller company compared, uh, smaller, sorry, economy compared to um, Brazil or other markets, it has been the country with uh, 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 with the, the, the largest growth uh, in the region in terms of percentage. Uh, there will be uh, presidential elections very soon, so in less than two weeks, in ten days, uh, about it will be in. Uh, in two Sundays on April 11th. Uh, and COVID has, uh, uh, talking about the, the impact of COVID, uh, this has uh, established the delivery apps that they were even before COVID already a reality in Peru. 
they were among the first in the region to go in through into a lockdown and they had a very strict one but the country is uh very informal in business uh some people did not follow the uh measures and the infection went back high again the vaccination has been slower uh in peru but now uh, moving now when we go over the regulatory so we have senasa and DGESA. they are uh, senasa the equivalent to the um, USDA and the JSA, the equivalent to the uh, US FDA, uh, Food and Drug Administration. Um, also, I'm sorry for the ceremony uh, in here, that's not uh, valid in Peru. They have a 0% a uh, import duty tax under the free trade agreement, uh, but that is not phased out yet currently. 80% of agricultural items uh, fall under the free trade agreement, but the phase out for 100% of them will be in 2026. So it is in the way. 18% um, uh, VAT, it's called uh, IGV in the country. It's in fact 16% to national tax and 2% depends on the municipality. Most of them will use 2%, but it could be even zero. The main documentation in Peru needed to export uh, by the side of the importer will be the license, uh, proof of payment and insurance that they submit to the government and the registration for some products. Uh, and for the exporter, uh, the certificate of origin, in some cases, the FIDO or zoo sanitary certificate and the free sale certificate in the United States. Uh, as for the label, the language uh, also has to be in Spanish. Uh, it's required the nutritional info. And since last year, since 2020, the stop signs came into Peru. Uh, basically the same thing as in Chile. Uh, now, the use of stickers for the uh, stop signs, those are still under discussion. In the uh, original law, original legislation, they were not allowed. Uh, last year, uh, it was uh, done an amendment to the legislation to allow stickers. That's valid until June 2021, and it is still under discussion to uh, be allowed uh, the use of um, stickers or not. If not, you would have to repack the product into a new labeling, put it inside a, a bag or, or come already with the, uh, the stop signs. We have been watching closely to that. Uh, and what's gonna gonna happen into that. Uh, now moving next, uh, as for retail and uh, food service. So the modern retail uh, here in, in, in Peru, it's around 24 billion in sales, but this is interesting. Traditional retail is still uh, predominant in Peru. This has been changing really fast. Uh, and, and modern re modern channel has been taken over traditional and that accelerated during the uh, pandemic last year. Uh, but most part of the sales are those small mom and pop shops uh, that, that are all around the city and all around the country. Uh, the main players are Sencosud, Supermercados Peruanos and Falabella. Sencosud is the uh, Chilean group. Uh, they have the uh, brands Wong and Metro in Peru. Supermercados Peruanos, it's a Peruvian group with uh, Vivanda and Plaza Bea. And then we have Falabella with Totos, the same as in Chile. Convenience stores has also been uh, growing in Peru with Tumbo Plus, the main brand, and they have also started offering their own private label. And e-commerce, of course, as, as in the region has boomed in the same rate as Brazil, 122%. Uh, as for food service, uh, Peru was very dependent on tourism, and uh, this uh, has impacted, of course, um, last year. So $1 billion uh, of uh, restaurants income for uh, tourists 
uh, tourism in the country. Uh, Peru is a gastronomic center. Peruvian cuisine is a very renowned and uh, very good and uh, Peruvians like to eat out. So only in Lima, only in the capital city, there are over 200,000 formal restaurants. Uh, those could be either food stalls or small or large restaurants, but 200,000. Two out of the top 10 best restaurants in the world are in Lima. Uh, three of them, if we consider the top 50. And around 20% of all the imported food and beverage in the country is for food service. Uh, and that has been shifting into retail now. Uh, U.S. food is uh, in Peru already. Peruvians uh, love U.S. Uh, food, so you can find them easily in hotels and restaurants. And uh, U.S. brands are a reality when you, we see fast food without Burger King, KFC, Starbucks, Pizza Hut. So it's all around, especially in Lima. And uh, their brew in the last five years has been uh, seeing an expansion of shopping malls. And that started in Lima and now they are countrywide uh, into uh, Peru. Now for the opportunities, uh, so cook up Cook at home is a reality, but all related to healthy, natural. This has been trending much because of the nutritional label. This also happened in Chile. When you start to let consumers aware of the products with the stop signs, there is this trend of nat nat natural, healthy, vegan, vegetarian. So this has been also... Um, happening in uh, in Peru. And uh, this is something really interesting, the seafood processing, reprocessing. So there is a project uh, in force uh, in Peru for allowing imports of seafood to be further reprocessed as Carol, Carolina mentioned, um, into the northern part of Peru through the port of Paita and then the region of Piura and the northern part of the country where there is a lot of um, seafood processing facilities in there and they can take advantage of that, that installed uh, facilities to reprocess U.S. food. Um, the challenge is the market is uh, concentrated yet in Lima. In part has not been uh, really spread around the country. The good, good side is most of the uh, population is in Lima. It is a price uh, sensitive market. COVID-19 has impacted tourism uh, and they have yet a cold chain infrastructure to develop. When we talk about products, uh, cheese, dairy and meat, uh, as other uh, countries in the region, they are very good prospects. When we talk about snacks, nuts, this is something that has been um, growing in the country and confectionery, all kinds of condiments and sauces and these for private label also. Uh, bakery, uh, ready to eat in food preparations, juices and uh, non-alcoholic uh, beverages, alcoholic beverages and seafood for uh, reprocessing. They are very good prospects also in uh, Peru. And now I get back to Carolina. Thank you. This will be quick. Actually, Ecuador is a little bit behind the other markets, despite Washington exporting a lot of uh, wheat and fresh fruit to this market. So, but uh, still, um, economically speaking, it's still a small economy. We have uh, 16 million people living over there, and the uh, US has 15% market share in agricultural items over there. And they have been discussing uh, agreements, trade agreements with the US, and the, there is a new protocol on trade rules and transparency with the US signed it last year. 
Um, food industry is consolidated, so that's why you should consider exporting feed and food ingredients and commodities to this market too, while retail, food service, and all the consumer behavior uh, is de um, being developed. Okay, uh, as per Peru, we see expansion in uh, shopping malls and also fast food. So this is something I know that's the key factor in development. But uh, anyway, there is a niche market for specialty consumer items and uh, as well for seafood reprocessing and uh, a lot of uh, re salmon reprocessing has been going on over there. Anyway, um, we see a domestic production cannot meet consumer meet the consumer dem demand right now, so they do need uh, to import. Uh, food industry needs imported inputs. Uh, the younger generation is an important consumer to keep an eye at, uh, and uh, these are driving, of course, the products that are entering the market. Um, we still, uh, we do see, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, Washington egg exports to the market and uh, smaller packaging will be uh, a trend over there too. So products, wheat, fresh fruit, food ingredients, seasoning, sauces, condiments, fish, meal, nuts, and seafood for reprocessing are good prospects for this market. Just then closing our presentation with a bit of delay, so let's say some time for questions and answers, but our main recommendations for you in South America would be build solid long-term relationships, okay? Because this is a relationship-based society, and we know how hard it is to do that over Zoom, but uh, do your best and uh, dedicate some uh, time for developing this market and uh, get to know your potential customer. And uh, if possible, have staff allocated to take care of this market. And uh, of course, uh, we also recommend you to have right partners. You don't need to work with uh, an exclusive buyer, an exclusive distributor, but uh, it's important to select good ones and build these relationships because they will be the ones helping you for the regulatory part and also building your brand locally. And be patient. We were talking about a new market here. You know, I'm, I'm sure that when we started exporting to other markets worldwide, it wasn't, you know, fast. So that's pretty much the same. So the difference of doing pace is different. So let's start the market. Let's understand how to ship some products for testing markets, support your partners and, uh, it is worth, let's think about long-term here. That's pretty much what we have. And Zach, I'll hand over to you to conduct the question and answer session. Thank you so much. That's, that was a lot of great information. Uh, we, I really appreciate that. I'm gonna open up, uh, just let everybody know if you would like, you can uh, feel free to un unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you feel more comfortable typing a question in the chat and I can go ahead and read that. So. Um, with that said, I'll go ahead and open the floor um, for any questions. I'll go ahead and ask the first question uh, to kind of open up. Um, with some of the, so obviously, uh, you know, you mentioned the, 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 the big markets down there. Do you see, uh, do you guys see any potential with Brazil as far as a free trade agreement or just some more better understanding with the US so to allow for better trade to happen um, in the near future? Okay, so trade agreements. So we have been seeing a lot about that uh, in news probably for the past few years. And um, it's kind of complicated to say that it will be going you know, to celebrate an agreement. But uh, what I can say is that uh, trade, the relation between the US and Brazil are good. So ministries of agriculture and all the agencies get along well, so which is important. But uh, we have been seeing a facilitated trade lately, especially in relation uh, on uh, registration. So if uh, before you, you had like you needed one year or over one year to get products registered here, you can do that in a couple of months now. So that's a, a good development. And uh, we have been seeing a lot of uh, new entrants, new exporters doing business in this market lately. 
Excellent. And we did get a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one are about nuts. Where does trail mix land in this market? Where's the best place for, for trail mix? I would say that, uh, of course, Brazil has potential for that. This is something that uh, we see a lot in the market. And uh, Leo, you can comment. Yeah. Uh, Chile and Peru. This is, this is, this is good for Colombia, Colombia and Peru. Uh, this is something uh, on their, uh, one of the best prospects, in fact, uh, all trail mixes and trail nuts and nuts uh, in general for those two countries. But we've seen, although Chile has uh, some production, we've seen them uh, also importing uh, nuts. Uh, but definitely Peru and Colombia are, are good prospects. All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so we do have a couple uh, more questions. Uh, the next one is, um, actually, I might be able to answer. Uh, are you able to help us find importers? And I think that the answer to that, Bauman, would be is if you get signed up for the one on one consultations, um, they can help uh, try and see what they can do with regards to finding some helping uh, finding some importers in the markets. Um, any anything to add on that, Carolina? Yeah, of course we can. We have uh, good relationships in the market. We love to connect exporters to importers. We would love also to engage in market researches, partner identifications, and uh, hopefully someday engage in a trade mission to the market. Excellent. Yeah, and speaking about trade missions, uh, Bauman actually, uh, he w went with me to Chile the last time I was there uh, for uh, the trade show there in Chile. And uh, so that was an excellent, an excellent show. And hopefully Bauman will, will visit there again. We're, we are planning that same mission with USADA this year if it does happen. So just keep that in mind for the rest of you all. Um, the next question is, can you expand a little bit on the pilot reprocessing project in Peru? Yeah, of course. This is a facilitated um, market entrance for seafood raw material in Peru. There is a presidential uh, decree that says that uh, seafood uh, going to reprocessing doesn't need to go through lab tests, neither inspections. So go straight to reprocessing plants and then can be re-exported to other markets. The good thing is that uh, Peru has over uh, 200 facilities, seafood processing facilities, and other food trade agreements with other markets in Europe, in Asia, and also uh, in South America. And uh, from there, you can export this uh, seafood final product to other markets with uh, uh, no import duty. The same applies to Brazil. So this is a very interesting project and uh, over 20 companies are registered for doing that. Wow, that's excellent. Um, the next question are, uh, they've heard that there are changes with regards to the health certificates that may cause concern for exporters. Can you give a brief description of what is happening? Okay, Brazil. So yeah, currently the Minister of Agriculture uh, is negotiating a few changes in the health certificate with NOAA. And uh, NOAA has responded already to DPOA and just expecting a, a date to put that a new document in place. But meanwhile, uh, the market remains open, no problems for shipping. And uh, we have been monitoring that with NOAA and the USDA. And uh, we expect the current uh, health certificates to be developed by June 30th. Okay, excellent. The next question is, liquor and spirits have uh, always have many rules. Are there technical requirements for imports into FTA countries, uh, ethanol or other analysis required? Okay, so alcoholic beverages, is that a question? Yeah. So um, yeah, there are requirements and always <laughs> alcoholic beverages always require a little bit more uh, work from the regulatory standpoint of view. But uh, what we can say is that uh, we do see a good flow of alcoholic beverages going to all the markets. So it's completely possible and doable. So I wanna highlight the potential for spirits in Chile and craft beer in Colombia and Peru, and of course, Brazil too. And uh, the magic here is just working with the partners, the importers, and they will be handling the registrations. The registrations. 
Awesome. Um, the next question uh, is, uh, are there uh, or is there any potential for pet food? Definitely, and uh, probably, uh, we didn't address that, uh, Colombia. Yeah, this is a great market. Of course, everybody, we see worldwide a trend of uh, pets being part of the family right now. This is not different in South America. So sales are growing a fast pace. So pet food, if you're talking about uh, value-added and ready products, I would recommend FTA countries. So Colombia and Chile. And of course, Peru with uh, opportunities. And if you're exporting ingredients for that, so let's explore Brazil too. All right. Uh, Brazil and Colombia for ingredients would be good just to add that. that. Okay. So uh, the next question um, is Can River Global advise for country on issues with regards to uh, uh, shipping and uh, sale business? Uh, so the question, I'll read it as, as it's proposed with some experience in export sfd products uh to brazil and uruguay it seems the sales shipping business isn't so difficult but the import regulations and license and labeling is much more difficult in making the sale can river global advise per country on these issues okay so brazil as i mentioned i don't know each specific seafood product that you're talking about uh so vic i don't know if you want to add something on that <laughs> that's yeah. okay uh, uh, as i mentioned salmon it's facilitated because as i mentioned uh we've had the new new online registration system uh we have been seeing uh, facil facilitated a process so you just need to register your plant or your vessel and then you do that for a letter sent to the fas post in brazil and then after that, you just uh, upload your application for registering your product. In your case, I'm sure you're working with a raw material, so h and Salmon. The approval is automatic. So once you insert, input all the information on processing and the transportation packaging, you're ready to go. So we have been working a lot on that and exporters uh, and exports are growing. So Uruguay, I didn't, uh, we can talk further about that, uh, but uh, I'm sure that, uh, it will be a more specific process to that. Uruguay, it's a new market. Excellent. And uh, for the last question that I see right now is currently in Brazil for big devaluation of the money. My partner customer who registered our product mentioned it is kind of difficult to import because by the time the product will arrive to Brazil, the price will be very high. How do you see the future of companies getting motivated to import product from USA? Yeah, this is, uh, as I mentioned during all the presentation, uh, one of the constraints in the market. But I would advise working with um, specific markets, so Sao Paulo, so you have to select geographically where to explore in Brazil. Perhaps you could explore smaller packaging too. Uh, perhaps you could uh, rethink the strategy in promoting and supporting with a, a little bit of marketing. Because I don't know exactly what a type of product you're talking about here. I could uh, go further on recommendations if I knew the product. But uh, there are a few strategies uh, we can recommend to you. And uh, we see a lot of companies doing that and they're being successful. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're, we're approaching the, our time limit here on our webinar. It's been a lot of great information. And I want to, again, thank you uh, to River Global and the team uh, for you guys being here with us and sharing this excellent information. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to the information, uh, to uh, the opportunity that we have at our hands. If you guys have not signed up for the one-on-one -on -one consultations, um, please do so. Um, and you can have more of that one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with River Global team um, and getting you know, more direct information on your product specifically. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again all uh, so much. Again, if you have uh, if you have any questions with regards to the one-on-one -on -one consultations, feel free to get a hold of me. I'll get you guys uh, the information to get signed up for that. Um, and I will let Carolina say her goodbyes and then we will end the webinar. Thank you guys all so much. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for participating. It was a pleasure to conduct the session. I know it's a lot of information, so please 
go ahead, talk to Zach and register for the one-on-ones and they'll be happy to provide additional information, more details and help, help you to do business in the market. All right. Well, with that, we are right on, on, the, on time. So thank you all so much and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.